committee to uh, uh, plant false memories of 10 years of rapes and bestiality. So what, you know, we needed a, an analog, something we could plant uh, that would have been, if it had happened, at least mildly traumatic for the subjects. And so at some point we came up, I and my graduate students came up with the idea, why don't we try to make people believe and remember when they were five or six years old, they were lost in a shopping mall, that they were frightened, they were crying, uh, they were ultimately rescued by an elderly person and reunited with the family. And after three suggestive interviews where we told our subjects that we talked to their family members, that we learned things that had happened to them, we convinced about a quarter of our ordinary adult subjects to have a complete or partial false memory of being lost in the mall. So the critics came back and they said, well, wait a minute. Getting lost is so common. At least show us that you can plan a false memory for something that would be a little bit more bizarre or unusual. And other investigators came along and they used our lost in the mall methodology and they planted, for example, you went to a family wedding, you were five or six years old, you knocked into the punch bowl, and you accidentally spilled punch all over the parents of the bride, succeeding with about a quarter of their subjects in getting them to develop this false memory. Uh, in another study, um, you were a victim of an indoor accident, a serious one. You were attacked by a vicious animal. You were you nearly drowned and had to be rescued by a lifeguard. Well, the critics said, you know, these are pretty strong forms of suggestion. We talked to your mother, your mother said these things happen. Uh, and we who do therapy, uh, the subfraction of people who are doing certain kinds of therapy, uh, we don't do anything that's that strongly suggestive. Well, they may not have been doing anything quite that strongly suggestive, but they were doing other kinds of things that were perhaps more subtly suggestive, but were also capable of leading people to false memories. So guided imagination. You don't remember who abused you, but you've got all the symptoms of someone who was. Why don't you just close your eyes and try to imagine who might have done this? Dream interpretation. Taking the material that the, the, the patient or client uh, dreamed about and interpreting that as evidence of sexual abuse. I mean, I've had court cases where she dreamt about a snake, the therapist said that was a penis. She dreamt about a serpent, the therapist said that was a penis. Uh, but when I had my uh, case in which I testified, where the patient dreamt about a cinnamon roll and the therapist said that was a penis. I thought, I don't get it. Um, but this is one of the good things about cross-examination because it was there that we were able to find out what was going on in the mind of that therapist. It was the goo on the cinnamon roll. The goo. So, I, I don't ever think about cinnamon rolls in quite the same way. Exposing people to other people's information applying them with false information about themselves or exposing them to doctored photographs. All of these techniques can lead people to develop false memories. Uh, in terms of those doctored photographs, I'll just mention one of my favorite studies was actually done by a former postdoc of mine, Mary Ann Gary, and her uh, collaborators. And they used the kind of lost in the mall technique, but they did it with photographs. So they took a photograph uh, fr from the family photographs of the subject when the subject was a kid. And there's the subject with the subject's father. And they photoshopped it into a hot air balloon ride and then handed the doctored photograph to subjects along with real ones. Uh, and by the time they were done with this, half of their subjects fell for the suggestion in the doctored photograph and started to remember this experience. We did something similar with public events, and inspired by this doctored photograph work, about a year ago, Slate.com published a long article called The Memory Doctor, which is about a lot of this work on memory distortion. And to uh, tap into, uh, to uh, first gather a little data from their 
readers, they showed their readers some photographs. And so they showed a photograph of President Obama shaking the hands of the president of Iran. And a number of people said, oh yeah, I remember that one. Uh, how about you remember when Roger Clemens was visiting President Bush on the ranch during Hurricane Katrina? A number of people said, oh yeah, I remember that one. Well, they couldn't have because they were created through Photoshop. So it was really someone else who was visiting President Bush, but Roger Clemens' photo was Photoshopped in. And our president never shook the hands of the president of uh, Iran. It was also created through Photoshop. And here are the data. This is really to die for. 5,000 subjects gathered in one week uh, from Slate.com. And you can see from the light blue bar, about 15% said, yes, I remember seeing uh, Clemens at the ranch. And the pink bar on the right, over 25% remembered uh, the Obama handshake. And they don't just say, yeah, I remember it. Many of them go on to provide additional details. Big Astros fan, live in Texas, very much remember this, said one of the subjects who fell for the Roger Clemens photo. Um, we recently got the data of 5,000 subjects from uh, Slate.com, and I and my graduate student have done a little bit of analysis here. It turns out, um, there is political ideology correlates with how commonly uh, you make the mistake. Uh, so it's the liberals who are more likely to fall for the Roger Clemens uh, Bush photo, and it's the conservatives who are more likely to fall for the Obama handshake. Um, let me just say, I have been attacked. Uh, another uh, common thing you hear is, Maybe these things really happened. Not with the doctored photos so much, but maybe the, maybe the subject really was lost in the mall. Maybe they really were attacked by an animal. The parent didn't know it, or the parent forgot. Uh, and you have revived a true memory rather than planting a false one. And to respond to this, I and my students have said, well, we got to plant some things that would be implausible or even impossible. And so in the implausible area, we planted a false memory that on a childhood trip to Disney you had your ear distressingly, disturbingly, and persistently licked by the Pluto character, succeeding with a significant minority of subjects. And the critics said, you know, maybe it really happened. Pedophiles like to go where they work with their lots of kids, maybe, you know, somebody didn't run into an ear licker. And so that was the genesis of our work in which we said, we're going to plan something impossible. Like you met and shook hands with Bugs Bunny at Disney. Impossible because Bugs is a Warner Brothers character, and when the LA Times wrote about this study after I presented it at the AAAS meeting, the editorialist wrote the Waskily Wabbit would be arrested on site. <laughs> Well, we have continued to learn as much as we can about the creation of false memories. Uh, we've been studying the consequences of having a false memory, and I can tell you they do affect, they have repercussions for people, they affect future thoughts and intentions and behavior. That when we try to, to see if we can find means of discriminating true from false memories, we find it's very difficult. The false memories look very much like true ones. I even collaborated recently in an fMRI study that showed that oh, even though there's a little bit more activation in the visual cortex when people that were recounting a true memory, and a little more activation in the auditory cortex when people are recounting a false memory, the overwhelming impression here is the neural signatures are very similar. We've done recent work on who is susceptible and who is resistant. Uh, with a, a large collaboration with Chinese uh, colleagues, uh, we've found that to some extent, if people score higher on standard tests of intelligence, they are somewhat more resistant uh, to these kinds of manipulations. Here's the one message that I've learned in now 35 or more years of working in, on these issues doing these experiments, just because it's vivid, detailed, uh, expressed with confidence and emotion, uh, doesn't mean 
It's true. I have discovered that I really intellectually have a lot in common uh, with Patrick's great grandfather, Hugo Munsterberg. Uh, he was a psychologist at Harvard who wrote a book called On the Witness Stand, uh, published in 1908. Um, and he was very interested in seeing science, uh, the science of psychology be applied to the legal system. Uh, he re received, you know, a lot of, he, he was controversial at the time, but I was very proud, I'm very proud to say that I did, they, they, there was just a reissue of that 1908 book, and I got invited to write the preface uh, for that reissue, so I was quite honored by that. So uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and Pat. And Hillary's only in there because I was going to tell you a story about her, but uh, I should have taken her out. And happy birthday, Pat.